Matthew chapter number 11, and uh, I realize it's the 4th of July. I kind of preached along those lines last Sunday, though. And uh, when I preached the message free indeed out of John 8, um, I thought about maybe doing some more like that, but I decided just to continue in our study here in Matthew. And we're going to try to finish the chapter. We left off last time in verse 19. So we'll pick it up in verse 20. I remind you that Matthew 11 through 13, those chapters are a pivotal section in the book. It's clear that the leaders in Israel are rebelling against the ministry of Christ, and so he shifts from his open proclamation of the kingdom to focus more on private preparation of his disciples for his impending uh, rejection, his crucifixion, his departure from them. And, you know, I pointed out for an example, I think last time, back in chapter 9, verse 34, but the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils through the prince of the devils. So, so you see the, the rejection here. And in chapter 12, look in chapter 12, verse number 14. Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath day. And look at the response. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him how they might destroy him. And so, in our last lesson, we saw that the forerunner of the king, John the Baptist, has been rejected. And it's clear they're rejecting the king himself. And it's just going to grow and grow till it culminates in their crucifying their king. And, of course, they say, we have no king but Caesar. They're rejecting him. And so, his ministry has been very open, very public. And, but the response among the leaders has not been good. Uh, there are crowds following, but it's very superficial. There's few true disciples that continue in his word. So things in this portion here is going to kind of shift. It's pivotal. When you get into chapter 13, he reveals mysteries of the kingdom in parables, and he does that to hide it from the Pharisees and, those, and the scribes, those rejecting him, in, in order to reveal it to his disciples. Now, I remind you that in the chapter here, you had in verse 1 to 3, John's question, John the Baptist, art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? And Christ answered to that in verses 4 to 6. And then how Christ testified about John the Baptist in verse 7 to 14. And then in verses 15 and 19, he gives an illustration about how the people rejected both John the Baptist and and they were rejecting Jesus Christ. And we left off, like I said, in verse 19. So this evening, verse 20 to 24, Christ upbraids the cities that he was preaching in for not repenting. And he then gives thanks to the Father in verses 25 to 27, and then offers a great invitation in verses 28 to 30. So let's begin in verse 20. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Woe unto thee. That's a word of judgment. Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethesda. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre, inside and they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes and you study that out the sackcloth the coarse material to afflict yourself and that and the the idea of the ashes uh, that's re, that's associated with mourning and repentance and all of that in the bible but i say unto you it shall be more tolerable for tyre and sidon at the day of judgment than for you and thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven. They were given such privilege and opportunity. Shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. But I say unto you that it should be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. That's pretty strong. 
He's denouncing them. He's upbraiding them. To upbraid has nothing to do with hairstyling. It has to do with reproving with severity. And there are, there are people who actually think Jesus never said anything negative, you know. This is pretty negative. He upbraids them. He's the judge. He's going to be on the throne in the coming day of judgment. And uh, there's different judgments to come in terms of you think about at his second coming when he judges the nations. For an example, Matthew 25. Um, he gives reward to his servants. There's a judgment in that sense as far as, and we're talking about the kingdom program of Israel. There's some judgment at his second coming, but there's also, of course, that great white throne judgment in Revelation 20. All the lost of all the ages stand before God. And the books are opened, and it's shown their name's not in the book of life. They're judged for their sins. They're cast. They're resurrected to stand before. They're resurrected out of hell to stand before God, only to be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. You read that in Revelation 20. Of course, now our judgment in this age, there is a judgment for believers today. It's called the judgment seat of Christ, and that's going to take place when the Lord comes for us and we're caught up to meet him in the air. There are different judgments to come. And when you study the timing of the judgments, the criteria, the people, the results, the purpose, all that, you clearly see there are different judgments. And you've got to rightly divide those things. But uh, in religion, often they teach one general judgment, and that's false. But there is a day of judgment. Christ will be on the throne. And, you know, John 5, verse 22, he said... The Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. And in Acts 17, I think about what Paul said on Mars Hill. Um, in verse number, I didn't have it marked. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Verse 31, because he hath appointed a day. This is a day of judgment. He hath appointed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance to all men that he hath raised him from the dead. He's the judge. And here's a little foretaste. Here's a little foretaste because he's, as the judge, he's denouncing, he's pronouncing woe on these cities for not repenting. Now, this is one of many passages that proves man has a free will. And recently somebody asked me, what do you think about the sovereignty of God and the free will of man? Well, I said, first of all, the word sovereignty is not even in the Bible, but free will is. Now, I know God is the most high. I know he has all power. And yet he's so powerful that he can give man a free will and still accomplish his purpose. See, the Calvinist pretends he's glorifying God. He's dishonoring God. He's saying God's so weak he has to make robots. That he has to make people do things in order to get things done. And God can give man a free will and still get done whatever he wants to get done. Okay, so there, the, the, the term free will is in the Bible. Okay, Man has a free will. He is held responsible for whether or not he chooses to believe his word. He's saying, look, you're responsible. You could have repented and you wouldn't. The word was preached to you. You had opportunity. You're responsible because you would not repent. Why would he say woe on them for not repenting if they couldn't? The point is they could have. They were not predestinated to damnation. There's not one verse of Scripture in the Bible that teaches that. Predestination only has to do with believers and it has to do with God's purpose for believers people are not predestinated to salvation or damnation believers are predestinated to be glorified but man has the responsibility to choose Calvinist says a man that believes that's a work that's not a, believing is not a work. The Bible said to him that worketh not, but believeth. <laughs> Romans 4, verse 5. So believing is not a work. 
And the Calvinist says, man's totally depraved. And what the Calvinist really means by that is total inability, that a man cannot choose to believe. The Bible does not teach that. Yes, a man's a sinner. A lost person is, is, is in an awful condition. And, but, but, and he's dead and trespasses and sins and that he's separated from God. Yet, he still has the opportunity and the capability of believing the Word of God if he chooses to. I mean, it's clear in the Bible. So... Anyway, the whole system of Calvinism, the five points, is really one point leads to the other. So what they say about total depravity, what they really mean is total inability. And because they say a man so depraved he cannot possibly believe, then the Calvinist winds up saying that God has to regenerate a man and then he believes as a result. But the Bible actually teaches that a man believes and then he's regenerated. <laughs> and so Calvinism is philosophy. It's bad theology. It came from the minds of men, not from the Word of God. It's a dangerous thing. Now, there's so many passages where it's clear God holds man responsible and that man has a will. The people in Chorazin and Bethesda and uh, Bethsaida, however you say it, and Capernaum. And, and Capernaum was the home, I mean, that's the headquarters. Remember back in Matthew 4, verse 13, it, that it said Christ leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum. They were exalted to heaven. I mean, they had the Son of God basing his ministry out of that city. That was his headquarters. Those people, and, and by the way, all three are on the northern coast of the Sea of Galilee, and that's where Jesus spent most of his time. They could have, they should have repented. That is where most of his mighty works were done. Not only him, but the twelve that he sent out. And the 70 in Luke 10 that he sent out, they saw great things. They heard great things. They could have, they should have repented, but they chose not to. Now, when he says Capernaum, that doesn't mean every individual is going to hell. It's saying as a whole, the majority, the city as a whole uh, did not repent. But I'm sure there was a, a remnant within, and God always has his remnant. Now, this passage also proves that Jews will not be saved just because they're the physical seed of Abraham. I mean, that issue is dealt with right away in the book of Matthew in chapter 3 when John the Baptist called, him, called some Jews a generation of vipers and said, don't even begin to think that uh, just because you're the seed of Abraham. He said, God, is, he can have these stones right up raise up children to Abraham. Matthew 3, I won't turn there for time, Matthew 3, verse 7 to 10. He warns them about the wrath. To, he said, there's a wrath to come. He said, if, if you don't bring forth good fruit, you'll be hewn down and cast into the fire. He's warning Jews about them going to hell. And they weren't going to be saved just because they were physical Jews. We saw it last Sunday in John 8, remember? Jesus told the Jews that, hey, I know you're Abraham's seed, but then he said, if you were Abraham's children. So he recognized on one hand they were physical seed of Abraham, but on the other, because they didn't have faith, they weren't the spiritual children of Abraham in the sense of faith. And he said, you're of your father, the devil. That's what he said to Jews. So there are actually people out there that think that all Jews are going to be saved in the end. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Only the believing Jews, okay? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, I mean, and Jesus told Nicodemus, I mean, a man of pedigree among the Jews, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. He said, marvel not that I said unto thee, ye, Israel, as we saw about in the context, must be born again. They can't see the kingdom of God without the Spirit of God. Them just physically of the flesh being a Jew wouldn't, wouldn't get it done. Now, that they were given great privilege and advantage does not mean in any way they're going to escape the judgment of God, but rather it means it will come upon them to an even greater degree. This passage teaches degrees of punishment. There's degrees to hell. Now, I, I don't want to go to any part of it. 
Well, let me show you. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Turn to Deuteronomy 32. Now, I'll make an application in just a minute. I think we can say something about America here. But while you're finding Deuteronomy uh, 32, let me read to you from Luke. Here's the principle, Luke chapter 12. And I won't read the whole parable for time, but here's the point of the parable. Verse 47, That servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. He knew what to do and didn't do it, so he'll be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did not commit things, uh, and did, excuse me, but he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. But that principle, unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required, the Jews had great advantage. They were given great privilege. They had light, more light than the other nations. So they're more responsible. So those Jews who died lost are going to suffer in hell to an even greater degree than the heathen. Now, hell is hell, but the, you know, look, look, look here in Deuteronomy 32. In fact, at the end of 31, it says in verse 28, Gather unto me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears, and call heaven and earth to record against them. For I know that after my death ye will utterly corrupt yourselves. Moses is saying to Israel, and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you, now notice this, in the latter days, because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands, talking about idolatry. And Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. Now notice the song in chapter 32, verse 1. And we're, we won't read the whole chapter, but let's skip around a little bit. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. Now let me just say, this is a song, and it's about doctrine. And God uses music to help us learn things. So if you've got music in the church that has no doctrine, it's pointless. Okay? And if you got music in the church that has wrong doctrine, and boy, one of these days we got to revise the songbook, I'm telling you. Every time I say something like this, I think, man, we got to do that. But anyway, he gives them in this doctrine. Look, look at verse number four. He is the rock, the Lord, of course. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. They have corrupted, corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. Maybe that's the mark of the beast. They are a perverse and crooked generation. Now, Jesus has a lot to say about a, a generation in his ministry, a generation of vipers, an evil generation, an adulterous generation. It was a generation prophesied. Look down in verse number. Let's skip all the way down to verse number 15. But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked... And this is another name for Israel here. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God, which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. And there's a little bit of a parallel when you think about our country and how it prospered. And in America's prosperity, they turned their back on God. Right? They, we used to have, look, we used to have people in this country that at least feared God at least knew the God of the Bible was the true and living God. And yet, in America's prosperity, so many being waxed fat, they are ungrateful. But anyway, and this is talking about Israel, not America, but this is just a little principle there. Verse number 16, They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, and abominations provoked they him to anger. Uh, they sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a very forward generation, children in whom is no faith. 
The word faith is actually only used twice in the Old Testament. Habakkuk 2 verse 4, the just shall live by his faith. And here it's saying they have no faith. They have provoked me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. And I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. And I believe that's a reference to the little flock of belief, true believing Israel. For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell. Now, of necessity, if there's a lowest hell, there's got to be a low and a lower. Right? That's degrees of punishment here. And shall consume the earth with their increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Uh, a fire, a fire is kindled. This is a baptism of fire. This forward generation. Peter called it an untoward generation in Acts 2. This generation that heard the Messiah himself, the rock himself, and rejected him. Yet there was a foolish nation, foolish in the eyes of unbelieving Israel, and that would be that little flock of true believing Israel. Believing Israel. But he's saying there's a, there's a judgment on them, these that have rejected him, the children in whom... Who is the children in whom there's no faith? It's Jews. It's unbelieving Jews. And he's, saying, he's talking about them when he says, My uh, fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell. So you go, back, and you go back to Matthew 11. He's talking about unbelieving Jews. He said, yeah, you've been exalted with great privilege and opportunity. And for that very reason, you're coming down to hell. You're being brought down. Now, Tyre and Sidon were ancient cities on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. If you look at a Bible map, you would see they were north of Galilee. They were known for their wealth. They were port cities. Very wealthy, but very, very wicked. And there's actually a lot in the Bible about, especially Tyre. He's saying if they would have had what you had, they, they would have repented in, dust, uh, in sackcloth and ashes. Sodom. He even brings up Sodom. And we all know how wicked Sodom was. Genesis 13, 13 with 13 words. You know about 13, right? Genesis 13, 13 with 13. You say, I don't know. You're, you're crazy with that number stuff. Well, maybe, but 13, 13 with 13 words, you know, that's kind of a, too much of a coincidence, I think. I think there's something to it, don't you? And it says that the men of Sodom would, were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And God, what did God think about the Sodomites? He rained fire and brimstone down and burn them up. More than that, he put them in the fire of hell. Okay? That's what God thinks about that abomination and that kind of stuff. And so he judged them fiercely. Well, Jesus said, you know what? If they would have had the opportunity you had, if, if I would have been there preaching to them, that city would still be here. How about that? Now listen, the reason they didn't repent wasn't because they were predestinated to damnation, but because they didn't have Jesus Christ preaching to them. Now they had a, they had a somewhat of a testimony from Lot, but it was a very poor testimony. <laughs> Lot was down there when he shouldn't have been, and you know the story. But they, there's no excuse for, for Sodom and Gomorrah. There was no excuse for their wickedness. But Jesus is saying, if I would have been there doing these works, they would have responded better than you are. Is that not a very insulting thing to say? And God even calls, by the way, he even calls them Sodom in Isaiah chapter 1 and other places. And in Revelation chapter, here, here's your holy land. In Revelation 11, God called it Sodom in Egypt. Jerusalem. He called Jerusalem spiritually Sodom. Tel Aviv has more queers than San Francisco. That's how wicked of a place Tel Aviv is today. It's wicked. So people think I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to get some kind of superstitious blessing from God because uh, I'd rather just stay in Jackson, Georgia. <laughs> you know what? 
I'll see it when the new Jerusalem comes down. That'll be even better, right? Now, I, I, look, I like history, so I think it'd be interesting to go over there. But what I'm saying is there, the only reason why it's holy is that God has set it apart for, to put his throne. But guess what? His throne's not there right now. And it's a wicked place over there right now. And God, God called Jerusalem, Sodom, and Egypt. That's the two worst places in the Bible. That's what he said. He said that's where our, the Lord was crucified in Revelation chapter 11. So he's saying, you're so bad, you, you know, you're, you're, you're so wicked that even those in Sodom would have repented and responded, and you're not responding. Now, the question comes, why didn't God send Jesus Christ to preach to Sodom? Why didn't he send him to preach in Tyre and Sidon? Well, he doesn't owe sinners anything. Okay? He didn't have a covenant with them. He didn't owe them anything. And, he, and, and here's the thing. All men have some light, and all are without excuse. There's a light of creation and a light of conscience. And if men respond to that, I think God will give them some more light. But Romans 1 answers the question, what about the heathen? It says they're without excuse because there was a time when the Gentile world, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were they thankful. And so uh, it's not evolution, it's devolution, you see, in Romans chapter 1. And things are going down, not getting better. And so God, he wasn't going to send Jesus Christ to preach in there. That, that, and he doesn't owe anybody anything. He, he doesn't owe anybody one opportunity to hear the Word of God. But if, we, if we're going to, you know what Christians do? They say, well, that's not fair. Why we, well, you know what? Why don't you go do something about it? If you're so concerned about the heathen, why don't you go preach to them? See, a lot of people on their high horse think they're more just than God. Well, he gave us the responsibility to preach to the heathen. And if the gospel's not going to the heathen, it's not God's fault. It's the church's fault. You understand what I'm saying? God knows what he's doing. You can trust him. All right, what about America? He said, Capernaum, you've been exalted. But boy, you're coming down. You know, we've been given much. We've got the word of God. You go down to the dollar store and for a couple bucks, you can buy a paperback King James Bible. There are preachers all over this country there's, oper there's information. You can go online and listen to any preacher you want to listen to. I mean, there's so much opportunity, and America has been given so much in terms of light. But light rejected becomes lightning. And even though America has had this opportunity, the reality is many in our nation are guilty of rejecting the Word of God. People in America, in a lot of cases, it's not so much they just don't know, it's they don't care. And you try to give them the Word of God, and they reject the Word of God. There is a greater degree of punishment on those who had access to it and rejected it. So America is going to be in a lower hell than a lot of heathen countries. I don't know what's going to happen. People always ask, what about American prophecy and so on? Well, the nations are mentioned. And it all depends on whether or not America sides with the Jews or not. Uh, and, you know, evidently it's not going to be a major player when the rapture happens. Doesn't that make sense? <laughs> You're talking about going down quick. <laughs> now, Let me make this quick application. We've got to move on because we've only covered a few verses so far. And I don't want to, it's 4th of July and you want to go out there and look at fireworks and stuff. But can you imagine dying and going to hell from a church that preaches the gospel every week? There are going to be people that heard the gospel regularly and never trusted Christ in their heart. You're going, to be in the, you're going to be in a hotter place of hell than, than you can imagine. So that's a fearful thing. 
gr with great privilege comes great responsibility. Okay? And if you've been given great in uh, light, you need to respond to that by faith. All right, verse number 25. And at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, <clears throat> Lord of heaven and earth. There's a Godhead. The Son's praying to the Father. He's not praying to himself. There's not, people talk about one person, that God is, one, God is three persons in one God, the Godhead. The Son is praying to the Father. I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. So those who seemed wise and prudent among men, these leaders in Israel, were rejecting the Lord. But he revealed great things to his disciples. Look over in chapter 13, Matthew 13, verse 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. So the wise and prudent don't get it. But the babes, those disciples that come to him like little children, trusting in him, they'll get it. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore spake I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. See, they willfully have closed their eyes. Now they're going to be blinded. Lest any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. So he's, he's talking about being rejected, and yet he prays to the Father and thanks the Father that he's revealed these things to babes. So the babes get it, and the wise and prudent don't get it. In Luke chapter 10, a parallel passage. In verse number 21, In that hour Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight, all things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. And he turned, unto, he turned him unto his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. And there, there's so many references to run here. I'm not for time. But I'll just quickly read to you out of Isaiah <clears throat> chapter 28. And you can just jot this down and look at it later. Maybe Isaiah 28. And I, I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, passage here. It says, <clears throat> verse 9, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the, uh, and drawn from the breast. I'm a babes. For precept must be upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Tongues was assigned to the people of Israel. To whom he said, this is the rest, it's the kingdom, wherewith he may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, the kingdom is the times of refreshing. Yet they would not hear. And, uh, but the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. And then in Isaiah 29, verse 13, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and Jesus quotes this in reference to the Pharisees, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men, 
Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. You get the point. He's saying it's hid from the wise and prudent. It's revealed unto babes. Now, Paul taught this in 1 Corinthians 1. He said, uh, God destroys the wisdom of the wise. The, the world by wisdom knew not God. He, he said, uh, you see your calling, how that not many mighty are called. He said, God hath chosen the weak things uh, to confound the, the, the mighty and the, and the foolish things to confound the wise. And I'm just rushing through that. The point is, he said that no flesh should glory in his presence. He's God, in other words, if God doesn't give it to you, you ain't going to get it. Okay, that's the redneck way of saying it, okay? And the, the principle is, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. You don't, if you don't approach God with a believing heart, He ain't going to show you nothing. You've got to humble yourself like a child. Say, Lord, I don't know anything. Please teach me, show me. You think you know something? You don't know nothing. Paul said, you don't know nothing yet as you ought to know if you think you know something. And so the things of God cannot be discerned by human intelligence and wisdom. Paul said, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered in the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, but he hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. So the principle is it take, divine revelation takes God revealing it. You're not going to get it through human intelligence and wisdom. The knowledge of God must come by divine revelation. Remember when Jesus asked his disciples, whom do men say that I am? And they said some this and some that. He said, well, who do you say that I am? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, blessed art thou. He said, flesh and blood hath not revealed unto thee, but my Father and so the way it's set up is we cannot know the Son without the Father or the Father without the Son. You can't separate them. They go together. The Son declares the Father. The Son reveals the Father. And there's so many verses. I'm not going to run the references. Um, I, I'll just give you one real quick. I'll read it to you. Uh, John 1.18 where Jesus it says that uh, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. He's the word that reveals and declares God. But you see, those who deny the Son of God do not know the Father. Now, there are a lot of religious people out there who deny the deity of Christ. And they deny the Trinity. And yet they claim to be following Jehovah or Yahweh, and all this stuff. They're not, they don't, look, 1 John, let me give you this real quick, and we'll move on to the last few verses. 1 John 2, verse 22. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. Whoso denieth, whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. So that's what Jesus is saying. No man knoweth the Son, but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. And he wants to reveal him, but you can't. he won't reveal him to you if you don't have faith in his word. It's up to you if you're going to look to him to get this revelation of God. The Bible's a closed book, even to the most intelligent, the scholars out there. They have more degrees than a thermometer, and they, they know all this stuff. And they, don't have a, they don't have a clue. You can take a, a, just a regular old guy that j just can barely read and have a King James Bible, and he knows far more spiritual truth if he has a believing heart. And so they looked at those fishermen in Acts 4, verse 13, it said, that's unlearned and ignorant men. That's the babes that, that divine revelation was given. It was hid from the wise and prudent. It said, yeah, they're unlearned. It said they were unlearned and ignorant men, but they had been with Jesus. <laughs> and they received his word and they knew the things. So there's a remnant that gets the truth. Divine revelation. I can do a whole message on that. Divine revelation. Now look, let me just briefly say, and we have to move on. God has revealed everything he's going to reveal in this book. 
And as far as application for us today, it takes the Spirit of God to reveal the things of God through the Word of God as we depend on the Spirit of God with a believing heart. But um, you can't know God without Jesus Christ. You can't come to God without Jesus Christ. He is the Word of God. All right, let's finish. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know, I just, I just realized, I looked outside, and it's like very bright out there. It's not even close to being dark, so I think I should just teach until it gets dark, and then we can step out and watch the fireworks. Don't you think that sounds like a plan? No, I'll just a couple more minutes. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, who but the Lord could say something like that? Can you imagine some man saying, Come unto me, all ye that labor heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. No man can say that. God is the only one who can give an invitation like that. Jesus Christ is God. He can give rest to all who will come to him. And this is a, look, even though he's being rejected, <clears throat> the invitation's still open for those who will come to him. This seems more like a personal invitation. He'd been preaching to the nation. He'd been preaching to the cities. But now, you know, so many are rejecting him. But the, the door's still open for those who want to be his disciples. The lost sheep of the house of Israel were heavy laden under the bondage of religious tradition. In Matthew 23, Jesus <clears throat> rebukes the Pharisees and he says, verse 4, For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. They're hypocrites. See, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, they were scattered, they were burdened down, they were heavy laden, there was no rest. And the self-righteous religion of the Pharisees could not remove that burden of sin. All they did was add to the load. They, they even got to where they were tithing off their herbs. They, they were going, they were more religious than the law required. And they, I, by the way, I still know, I know preachers today that have more standards than God does. And they'll judge you on those standards, even though God didn't say anything in his word about it. They, I mean, you know, but anyway. They added so much. And uh, quickly, Psalm 38, let me read this to you, verse 4. For mine iniquities are gone over mine head, and as a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. So he's saying to these people, you're under this load of sin, you're under the guilt of sin, that religion that you're trusting in. And look, God gave Israel religion. The problem was it was corrupted by traditions of men, and it was going, they were going about it with the wrong heart. They were being self-righteous. And he's saying, that's not going to get it done. Israel will find rest in the kingdom when they're under the new covenant made in the blood of Christ. It will become a law of liberty. It will be pure religion, James said. There will, there, his, look, his yoke under the new covenant is going to be easy. The law is going to be written in their heart. They're going to serve God in liberty. And... It's not a lower standard in the kingdom. They're under the law, but they have the power to do it because they'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. And there will be some changes in the law, but it's still law. But the difference is, he said, if you come unto me, if you trust in me, I can give you the rest that you're looking for. Now, again and again, and you see it in Hebrews especially, we saw it in Isaiah just a minute ago, that the kingdom is a rest. The seventh day. The Sabbath, is, he gave it as a sign to Israel. It's a day of rest. And I believe that the final, look, I believe there's 7,000 years roughly of human history, and that last millennium is the kingdom age. So that means the rapture is going to happen in about, oh, five minutes. 
<laughs> our calendars are not accurate. We we don't have we can't be exact on these things, but it's going to be a great rest for them. We know the rapture of the body is going to happen before the trib, and then the trib, seven, 70th week, then the second coming, then the rest in the kingdom. So if we're coming up on a, we've completed, you know, 6,000 years of human history, but we don't know where, where and, and God's calendar is different than man's, and you, we should be looking for the Lord to come every day. I mean, that's, that's the point Paul makes, and there's a difference, of course. I just interjected that there, but there's a great difference between us looking for our rapture and God's dealings with Israel. But in the meantime, in the meantime, they're going to get that rest. He's going to give them rest. But these disciples, he said, learn of me. And that's what a disciple is, a learner. They were to learn of him. He, he's everything that Israel needed and everything that Israel needed to be. He said, if you learn of me, not this pride, not this arrogance. I'm meek and lowly in heart. If you'll learn to be like me, you're going to find rest to your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. In other words, these disciples going out laboring, even though the Lord's being rejected, uh, it's quite a, uh, they were laboring and yet they could have, uh, if they're in the yoke with Christ and they cast their burden upon the Lord, you know what a yoke is, a yoke of oxen, two oxen pulling in service. If you're in a yoke with Jesus Christ, then that's all the strength you need, right? I mean, he's saying it's easy, it's light because you're depending on me. So these disciples, and there's two, by way of application, he said, you shall, I will give you rest, and then you shall find rest. There's a rest that comes immediately when you trust the Lord, but then there's a rest to your soul you learn, when you learn of him and discipleship and walk with him and serve in the yoke with him. Now, again, he's talking to, to Israel, but there's an application. There's an application. When we are heavy laden, it's because we're not trusting the Lord like we should be. Cast thy burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain thee. You say, I got a heavy burden, brother. Well, why are you trying to bear it in your own strength? There's a, somebody said, the Lord will never, the Bible says, the Lord will never put on you more than you can bear. Paul said one time he was pressed above measure, <laughs> above strength, in so much he despaired of life. There's a whole lot you can't bear. But you can bear it if you trust the Lord. The Lord bears it with you. In other words, if you cast your burden upon the Lord, and then Paul also told the believers that we ought to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, Galatians 6. So if we learn to cast our burden upon the Lord by faith, trusting Him with what's on our heart, and then we learn to, to, to quit being so cotton-picking proud where we can't ask for help from somebody... And we can learn, as a, as a, especially in the local church, to depend on one another and to help one another. Then it won't be so heavy. So when we try to do it ourselves, we have the problem, right? And so if we'll just learn of the Lord and trust in the Lord. You know, so if you're burnt out in Christian service and it's a drudgery to serve the Lord. And, and it, Christians crack me up. They act like going to church a couple times a week is like something they should get a big award for. Like they're really impressive, you know. Anybody can do that. Lost people can do that. Oh, come on, folks. But there are, the reason why there are so many people that are miserable in their Christian walk and they're, they can't be faithful because they're not trusting the Lord every day like they should be. That's the bottom line. Because if you will trust the Lord, he, His yoke is easy and His burden's light. It's not, a, it's not grievous when it's from the heart in the power of the Holy Spirit. There's application here for us. You know, your, you, your work for the Lord needs to be strengthened by your walk with the Lord. And if you're like, if you're like Martha, cumbered about <laughs> with much serving, you know, and then you, then you criticize those who sit at Jesus' feet and, I don't have time to read the Bible, I'm too busy. Well, that's your problem. You know, if you would, if you would get strengthened spiritually, then you wouldn't be so stressed out. <laughs> By the way, Jesus didn't tell Martha not to serve. He just said Mary chose the better part, and you've got to get your priorities right. And if you will 
trust the Lord and get strengthened spiritually, then you can serve in that power. Well, good night. It's 8.15. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, thank you for the word tonight and the principles we looked at, things in context for Israel, but also applications for